Hey guys, uh, just about to talk about the chapter called Numra, which uh, gives us a lot of extra information about Sifra and the sun and the change in him. He talks about the Lopat and who is the Brigadier and uh, clearly Sipo is involved in some uh, activity of the ANC or other underground organizations who are against apartheid um, and has obviously joined the, the youth movement and the struggle and this chapter gives us more information about that. Again, you'll be in one of my classes, so if it's a little odd, um, that's okay. I'm sure you'll get the gist of the situation. This is a very important chapter. Chapter is Nomda. Okay, we all know who Nomda is. Nomda Koshani is the CC. Alright? She has a son now. Well, we've read about her son before. When we read about her son before, what do we read about, about him? His sister's teasing him to play soccer. He's a boy. He's a real boy. And he sees himself as the man of the family. Although he is so young. He's the only one in the house. Now, we get a very different picture of Sipo from Nomda. Listen to what she says in this first paragraph of that chapter. Without her really understanding when or how it happened, he became a man. There is a different feel to a home when it has a man in it. When a man lives there, and one afternoon it came to her. A man lives here now, and on the heels of that thought, another thought. He is the man, my son, which brought pride, but also sadness and worry. So you see this. There's pride because she's proud of what her son has become. It brings sadness because the days of his youth are over. He's no longer her little boy. But it also brings worry because it means he makes his own decisions now and she doesn't know what kind of trouble he might get himself into. Okay. And so uh, she doesn't, he doesn't play. We read about Sipo. He doesn't play soccer anymore. He starts coming home later and later. We read that she is convinced that he hasn't been with a woman and drinking. But she can't sense those things on him. So he's obviously been busy with something else and she is not sure what that is. Listen to what she says on page 135, near halfway down the page. He starts to go out again. He goes at night. He does not say where he is going, but sometimes comes back when she is getting up for work and the sky is already grey. He can't avoid her because he sleeps on a mattress on the floor of the main room with a big double bed in the corner that she shares with her mother. She says, where have you been? Where is Sipo? Where do you go? But he only grunts and lies down on the mattress, pulling the blanket over his head and ignoring her. There is no evidence of alcohol or duff on his breath. At first she thinks he is going with a woman, and she is disgusted that he would take a woman before he has been to the bush. But she sees from his reserve of the girls, his sisters bring to the shack, that he is still without experience. And he does not smell of woman either. In the doors. But his voice, which no longer stammers between high and low, is hoarse as if he had been talking through the night. So we are not told exactly what he's involved in, and yet we can infer what he is involved in. We have some information. He's not with the women. He's not smoking juvie. He's not drinking. He's not going with women, okay? But he has been talking all night. We're in apartheid South Africa. Three years before this, what has happened in South Africa? The Soweto uprising. He is a young person. He is starting to find his voice. What is the implication or what is the inference of what he's involved in? The struggle, the resistance. He's been talking things all night. He's no longer this little boy who squeaks, he's in puberty. He's a man who has found his voice. He's clearly involved in the struggle. Okay, now we're not given that information, but it's inferred. Just a little bit down on page 136. The one that they were afraid of. They call the leopard. Okay, now this is a policeman. He's called the leopard. Actually, in Afrikaans, he lay back. Now, what, what do you think is significant about someone being called a leopard? They hunt at night. They're dangerous. You never see them when you least expect them. They sly. And so this guy is the leopard. They're all afraid of him. She has seen him on three or four occasions, always in the passenger seat of the yellow van, which a junior policeman drives around the township, looking and looking. She tries to think that they could just be looking for drugs. When she was a girl, the police drove by that through the streets just looking for drugs. And no one was scared of them, even though it was stricter in that time with a curfew for blacks. The first time she came to visit in the town from the farm, she forgot to pay attention to the curfew time. And when the siren went, she had to run hard through the streets and the people were leaning out of the doors and laughing. But it is not like that anymore. Nowadays they don't laugh and the doors are shut. 
The third time she saw me late that, it was just outside her house. He called over, called her over and said to her in her own language, Hello, Mama, what have you been doing? Shopping, boss, she said. She was holding the shopping bag. He looked at the bag, touched his moustache with the back of his long finger in the odd way he has, which is one of the reasons they call him, you like that. And is this Mama's house? Yes, boss. He nods politely, but she knows that with policemen it is better if they shout and give orders. At least you know where you are. And it, it goes on, she looks at the white policeman with him, and even he's afraid of the late act. Yeah, a leopard. Alright, now, there's a sense here, we get this almost ominous sense that the late act is after Sipo. She has just said that Sipo is out late at night, and now the, le the leopard is hanging around their house. So clearly, he is looking for her son, and I think inside, her fear is that as well, that he is after uh, his son. Then, we get real indication of that at the end of that chapter, from page 137. Mama, she says a little, Mama, I'm in trouble, Mama. She turns to her weary, weary for the trouble he causes, weary for everything. Just stay here, she says, don't go out like this all the time. Mama, his voice is high, stricken, winding out the child's. She waits free and sits up in bed, causing her own mother to twitch away from her. She sees that he is sweating. The dark eyes descended and blinking rapidly, breath sucked gaspingly into clenched lungs. The arm of his jersey has a ragged tear, as if he snagged on something while running. Fright vibrates through her so violently that the fright is physical pain. It's too late, Mama. Here is the most dangerous place. So we start piecing this together, don't we? Why was the leopard asking, is this Mama's house? He was putting two and two together. He knew that's where Sipo lives. Sipo has obviously been involved in some sort of resistance movement or the struggle. So, the Lakehead has his number. His time is running out. He realizes that. He's clearly run away from police. Maybe there's a raid or something. He comes home, he says to his mom, Mom, I'm in trouble. Help me, I need somewhere to hide. She says, stay here. He says, I can't. This is a dangerous place already. And then she says, I know where. There's only one other place she could take it. Where is that? The, shed. the school. school. The school is a shed. Okay, this has been mentioned before. And so we will see now, as we move into the chapters ahead, that Sipo hides away in the school shed. The next chapter, Voting and Politics, takes us back to London, where Lully and Pim are talking about the current South African situation and the politics and the voting that is happening. Uh, there you can see Pim starts with, I will not vote for the ANC and a future opportunity because of that system.